For our next talk, we have Steve Fascio, who is a conservation biologist from the Vermont Center of Coco Studies, and he will be talking about bioaccumulation and trophic transfer of methylmercury in wood frogs and spotted salamanders in Vermont vernal pools. Great, thanks. So this, uh, what I'm going to be talking about, the amphibian portion of this work, is part of a larger project looking at uh, mercury cycling and trophic transfer in vernal pools in Vermont. And um, just just having a chance to um, start to look at the data. So this is really some preliminary results from this larger project. Um, I think probably most of us know what vernal pools are, but just to make sure everyone's on the same page, we're talking about these small, shallow, isolated uh, wetlands that typically occur in forested situations and are fed primarily by surface water. Um, they have a distinct seasonal hydrology where they fill up in the spring, spring rains and snow melt, and then over the course of the summer, um, discharge you know, a lot of evapotranspiration of the water and uh, often dry out, if not every year, then at least in drought years, so it limits populations of fish. Uh, they also provide critical breeding habitat for a number of amphibians, uh, as well as providing or supporting pretty rich communities uh, of invertebrates. And I should, I'll just mention that the three mole salamanders that we see here, the, the blue spotted up in the upper left, spotted salamander, and the Jefferson salamander, all listed as species of conservation, greatest conservation concern in, um, in the Vermont Wildlife Action Plan. So we know from past work uh, by a lot of folks who have presented here at BMC meetings in the past that the Northeast is a hot spot for mercury deposition, atmospherically deposited mercury, primarily originating from coal-fired power plants in the Midwest as well as industrial incinerators. And there are certain landscape characteristics that can really enhance the transport of mercury as well as the conversion to methylmercury, which is a more bioavailable and more toxic form. Um, and one of it is, uh, is just a forest canopy enhances mercury transport. The leaves scavenge mercury out of, out of the atmosphere, and then it can be deposited through in through fall or in litter fall. And um, keep in mind that the base of the food chain in a vernal pool is leaf litter. Um, that, that drops in the pool and each off. Um, mercury transport is also greatest in shallow flow paths, so primarily in surface water, you're gonna get the greatest amount of mercury transport, which applies to vernal pools. Uh, water level fluctuations enhance methylmercury, or methylation of mercury, also applies to vernal pools. Low primary productivity um, increases mercury in biota, um, vernal pools don't have a lot of primary productivity going on because they're ephemeral, don't get much sunlight. And then there are these mercury sensitivity indices that can clue you in as to how sensitive an ecosystem will be to mercury. Um, so if total phosphorus is less than 30 micrograms per liter, um, that's true of our study sites. They were well below that, 0 0.8 or 0 0.08 micrograms. Dissolved organic carbon, if it's greater than four milligrams per liter, ours were, uh, average was 14.6. And pH, uh, if pH is, is uh, less than six, also in increases the sensitivity. Um, and ours are kind of borderline, the average was 5.8. <clears throat> um, so the, the main goal of this larger project was to look at the influence and lands landscape characteristics of, of forest type, primarily um, uh, forest type and land use on the production and uh, transfer of methylmercury in pools. And our objectives um, to, to look at the, to try to reach that goal was to look at um, mercury levels and water chemistry of water samples at a, on a broad scale uh, across the state. Um, so we sampled 21 pools, water, just water samples. And then we wanted to monitor the, the trends, the temporal, temporal trends of, of mercury in a subset of those pools, it's just six pools in a smaller area to look at sources and pathways of mercury loading. So that included monthly samples of water, soil, leaf litter, and water chemistry. 
And then we also wanted to analyze mercury in the, bio, in the, in the food web, in the, in the biota. So we were sampling a whole suite of invertebrates at different trophic levels, uh, as well as amphibians at different life stages, so eggs, larvae, and adults. <clears throat> so I'm just going to be talking about the amphibian portion of this larger data set. So here are sample pools. So the, the temporal or the, uh, the, the spatial trends or the spatial scale uh, samples of the 21 pools include both the green and the blue on this map. And then the, the pools I'm going to be talking about in this talk are just the six located in, in the, or de depicted in blue. Those are our intensive sample spots, sample locations. Here they are closer up. They're all in the upper valley. White River Junction is at the bottom center of this photo, just to orient you. And we want, and we had three pools in coniferous stands; those are the yellow, and three in deciduous stands. So we could look at a little bit of, at the effect of forest type. So here are just some visuals of our pools. Deciduous pools are on the left. Conifer pools are on the right. And the last two, uh, and they, you know, they ranged quite a bit in size and depth and watershed area and pH. But average, the, the coniferous pools tended to be smaller in size. They tended to be shallower, quite a bit shallower, 40, average of 43 centimeters compared to 93 centimeters for the, for the deciduous pools. And a much smaller watershed area uh, for the conifer pools as well. And that, that was the, large, the larger watershed area among the deciduous pools was really driven by one particular pool that had this huge uh, two hectare watershed. Um, and then pH, as we expected, the pools in conifer stands had a lower pH than those in the deciduous stands. So our sampling methods for the amphibians, um, for the adults, we, we captured adult wood frogs and spotted salamanders in the spring when they moved to the pools to breed, primarily using funnel traps. Um, and then we selected four individuals uh, per site, per species, so four wood frogs, four, four salamanders uh, for sampling for a total of 24 uh, at each site. Uh, and we took blood and tissue samples from the adults. We collected uh, blood from wood frogs using a, a facial vein, just with a needle puncture, very simple. And then we collected the tip of one hind toe, um, about, we're talking about four or five millimeters of a, of a toe not including any webbing. And then for the spotted salamanders, uh, we, just, we just took a, the tip of their tail, so about a centimeter um, amputated of the tip of their tail, and then collected any blood from that, from that uh, procedure. For the embryos <clears throat> at each pool, we collected from each egg mass, we took about a small, a small sample of five to 10 embryos from each from, from five different egg masses. So we didn't collect an entire egg mass, but we just took five or 10 embryos from five different egg masses at each pool for each species. And then larva, we collected um, early stage larva. These are like a week post hatch. And then late stage larva, um, somewhere between six and eight weeks post hatching. Uh, we collected four from each, four per species from each pool. For each stage. All right. So the mercury analysis was done um, by Vivian Taylor at the um, Trace Element Lab at Dartmouth um, using mass spectrometry, and Vivian processed all the samples. She's really well known to do a really thorough job and is really good at extracting mercury, getting mercury results from really tiny samples. So we'll get to some of our preliminary results. So here we're looking at methylmercury in water and embryos of spotted salamanders and wood frogs by habitat. So green bars are conifer, blue bars are deciduous. So you can see the water um, is kind of what we expected, a little bit higher mercury in the conifer pools than in the deciduous pools. I don't know if these are statistically significant. I haven't done any stats to this point, just kind of looking at the data graphically to get a sense of what's going on. Um, but then we, then we look at the, uh, the egg masses and it's pretty clear that the adults are, the adult females are, are offloading <coughs> some of their mercury burden 
into the eggs. So I don't think that the eggs would accumulate four times, four to six times the amount of methylmercury than the water has that quickly. Um, so it's likely the adults are offloading some of their mercury burden when they lay their eggs. Um, the, the problem, it doesn't appear to be an effect of habitat in the, as far as eggs go and levels of mercury. Wood frogs um, seem to be offloading more of their methylmercury than, than the spotted salamanders do. All right, let's move on to the adults. Um, so this is uh, mean methylmercury in spotted salamanders by habitat. I'm just looking at the larva at this point. And just to I put the embryos in there to give you a sense of scale, the scale difference. So um, really interesting pattern here that the early stage larva accumulated methylmercury really fast from, from um, you know, what was it before? Was it uh, talking about four nanograms per gram uh, up to over 300 in the deciduous pools? significantly higher in the deciduous pools compared to the coniferous pools. Why, I'm not sure at this point. Um, it could be a difference in prey base. Maybe there's a lot, a, a very different prey community that they're feeding on. As larva spotted salamanders are, are carnivores, they're feeding on small organisms uh, in these pools. Uh, but maybe there's something geochemically going on with the methylmercury that it's less bioavailable in the conifer pools. Um, we don't know yet. So that, that's going to require some more, some more sleuthing. Uh, and then we see this really strange pattern that we did not expect with the late stage larva that the, that the amount of mercury is decreasing. We expected it to increase, to bioaccumulate as they're feeding more, they're getting larger, they're feeding on larger prey, maybe even cannibalizing smaller um, salamander larva or tadpoles. Um, but we see this drop in both, both habitats. So um, can't explain that either. Uh, maybe it has something to do with physiological changes that are going on in the larva as they approach metamorphosis. Um, we know they, they stop feeding at a certain point, but I wouldn't expect them to lose mercury that rapidly. Uh, so I don't know. Don't know what's going on there. And then here are the adult levels, um, comparing the tissue and the blood. In the adults, no difference in habitat uh, and really no difference uh, in, in tissue versus blood. There's some evidence in, others, in other organisms, birds in particular, that mercury in tissue represents sort of a lifetime accumulation of the mercury, whereas blood represents the recent accumulation of mercury. I don't know if that holds true for amphibians or not. Uh, so let's compare that to wood frogs. Um, so I kept the scales on the left the same, so we could really get a sense of how much lower it is in wood frogs. Um, no difference in, in the habitat in the early larva, but they have the, the pattern I would, we would have expected to see, that it increased uh, in the later stage larva, more mercury, and it's higher in the, in the conifer pools, which is also what we would expect. Um, and the adult levels uh, uh, like the salamanders drop off a little bit and are quite a bit lower, about half that. Um, <clears throat> so here we're just looking at the percent methylmercury. So it's the, it's the methylmercury divided by the total mercury uh, in the uh, embryos or in the various life stages for both species. So spotted salamanders are the spotted bars and the wood frogs are the orange bars. So the interesting thing to note here, I think, are just how high the percent methylmercury is, particularly for the spotted salamander larva. And it doesn't drop off as much in the later larva. So even though the mercury declined quite a bit um, in the late stage larva, uh, the percent methylmercury is staying really high. And it's, and it's quite high uh, among the adults as well, particularly among in the, in the adult blood. In some, of, in some of our wood frogs samples, the percent methylmercury was 100%. So just to quickly summarize, um, the eggs had fairly low um, methylmercury levels, but significantly greater than the background water levels, suggesting that the females are offloading or decorating some of their mercury burdens. 
uh, methylmercury in the salamanders accumulated really rapidly, 50 to 100 times the egg levels in just, we're just talking about a week or two after laying. Um, uh, and it was significantly greater in the deciduous pools. And then it dropped off near metamorphosis. Don't know what's going on there. Uh, wood frogs accumulated methylmercury a little more slowly, uh, 10 to 20 times the amount of the eggs, uh, but increased with eggs and was, and was uh, greater in the coniferous pools. So the opposite pattern of the spotted salamanders. Um, so this elevated methylmercury in the larva has significant implications for the you know, trophic transfer and biomagnification of mercury in aquatic food webs. So whatever is preying on those salamander larvae, whether it's predaceous diving beetles or newts or who knows what else, you know, larger um, salamander larvae like Jefferson's um, are getting huge doses of uh, methylmercury, uh, particularly in that early stage. And just to compare our results, so here in the yellow, our results are amount of methylmercury in wood frogs and spotted salamanders. Comparing it to some lab studies of, of mercury fed to <coughs> tadpoles in their diet. So in wood frogs, uh, in a lab study, it was found that 89 nanograms per gram, so roughly about the levels we were seeing in the wild, showed no adverse effects on at least tadpole development, survival, or or behavior. But for southern leopard frog tadpoles, at just 13 nanograms per gram, they had lower survival and decreased metamorphic success, as well as some abnormalities. And American toad tadpoles at 51 nanograms per gram uh, showed impaired growth. So it's pretty clear that there's quite a bit of variability in the sensitivity to mercury among different species. And to my knowledge, there's been no work as to how sensitive uh, spotted salamanders or, or other salamander, mole salamander species are to mercury. So we, we just don't know what those large uh, mercury burdens, how they affect salamander larvae. Uh, in the adults, uh, the mercury in spotted salamanders was twice that of the wood frogs. That's probably just due to the fact that salamanders live much longer than wood frogs. Wood frogs probably just you know three or four years uh, lifespan, whereas salamanders live you know, can live probably 20 years, so just have the time to accumulate more. But it could represent a pretty significant source of methylmercury into the terrestrial food web. So future work, the one you know, if if we get additional funding, the one life class we're missing is the metamorphs. Um, you know, what does does the met, does the methylmercury continue to drop in those spotted salamanders until they reach metamorphosis? Or are those little metamorphs that climb out of the pools that are just an inch long, are they, you know, are they loaded with, with methylmercury? Are they little methylmercury bombs? Um, and what about wood frogs? Does it continue to increase as they approach metamorphosis or does it drop off? Uh, we don't know. And then what about other species? Some of the other um, salamander species? And what are the differences in mercury burdens of the adults by sex? Most of our samples were male. We had a few females, but not enough to compare those differences. So that's it. Thanks to our funding. This was funded by a grant from NSRC. So if you have any time, I'll take some questions. Very cool. Like really, really. <laughs> um, what if the operational model of the salamanders or the frogs accumulating mercury as a food web function is wrong? What if those uh, organisms acting as the semi-permeable membranes that they are are actually accumulating the methylmercury in the same way that methylmercury gets into phytoplankton, meaning that they're just taking it out of the water? And I think that might explain a lot of what you see, um, especially like the blood exceeding tissue in adults, would speak to the blood taking that in, passing through the tissue, and perhaps depurating some of it. I don't know. It's really fascinating. Yeah, that, that's interesting. We might be able to get, get at some of that, you know, with with the looking at the invertebrates, and because um, we're also doing some uh, 
stable isotope analysis of the invertebrates, hopefully to be able to oh, nice. sort of connect the food web. Because it would also explain like a huge jump from egg to you know to, to, to larva. larva. Yeah. If it's just yeah, sort of that's a good point. assimilating it from the water and it's you know passively coming in, yeah. hooking up to whatever protein cells are finding. Yeah. yeah, and, for, and cool. for some of the pools we have weekly water samples so we can look at the changes over time. That would be yeah. super. Cool. Okay. Well, I wonder if that would explain the high percentage. Of but did, did yeah, you have coal it's... mercury in the water? Because yeah. this methyl in water were extremely hot. Yeah, that's the point. Oh, yeah. That's, okay. that's the point. That's why it, it works. And as you said earlier, you know, in the head like, in the first like, in the vertical pools, it could be accumulating and they could be sitting out in the early stage and then that way as well. We'll have to see this discussion. <laughs> 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 Love it.